we've entered into Lent and we're going to have a series now that is talking about the Lord's Prayer and what that means for us, the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that's been given to us. It's kind of a gift at our baptism. It's that gift to all of us, uh, young and old. It is that for the novice and that for the mature. It is the thing that takes us from being a novice in the faith to being mature in the faith. It's something that will always be bigger than us, but that we will continue to grow into. The Lord's Prayer. It's a beautiful prayer that uh, was given to us, given to us by Jesus himself, for us to understand who God is and our relationship to God and to one another. So today we're talking about uh, the very first part, our Father, our Father. You know, we all enter into prayer in our own times. When you pray, Jesus says, and uh, in that, you know, we think about when you uh, maybe have a chair you sit in where you pray, where you take that deep breath at the end of the day, or maybe at the beginning, that the uh, table you sit at with your coffee and, and read scripture and take time to pray. Or maybe when you're walking, and you know, a lot of people as they're making rounds in the neighborhood, they use that time for prayer. Uh, it may be many places, but we enter into prayer for something more than us. We, we enter into the mystery of God, the very heart of God. That's our, the reason, right? We want to connect with the one who made us. We want to connect with one who can give us wisdom and guidance for our lives. We want to connect with God, the Father, the creator of the universe. And that is our longing, our heart, so that we can both speak with God, but so that we can hear God's voice and respond to it. And so we pray. We pray with, with great hope. We pray also with great confidence. You know, our Father is sometimes very difficult to say for people, and I recognize that. There are indeed many things in my own father's life, as much as I adore my father, as much as I was uh, thankful for him and said so many good things about him, as much as I do, I would not want my father to be the father. Others have had more difficult situations, uh, maybe facing abuse or neglect, anger, not knowing who you're going to be facing next time you come into the door. It could be someone who's been unfaithful to your parent, unfaithful uh, to you. There are many things that are stumbling blocks, and as we begin this prayer, our Father, that it has this visceral reaction for us. How can I call God my Father when I know what a Father is like? You see, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying, so, you know your earthly Father, your heavenly Father is just like that. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. And thank God for that. <laughs> He's saying something so much more. He says, our Father. So where does that come from, that, that idea of God as our Father? It didn't just start with Jesus. And some people want to think, well, Jesus brought a, uh, a newer, kinder, more grace-filled, loving God. And so you call him Father. But that's not really the case. It starts back with uh, the time of Moses. God called Moses. Moses was, saw God revealed at a burning bush and the voice that came to him and said, I am Yahweh. I am God. I am being itself. And I'm calling you to set my people free. The very first words that are spoken to the Pharaoh by Moses are this, that the Lord God has said, let my son let my son Israel free. Isn't that powerful? That is the very first time which God calls his people his children. And it's a time of deliverance. It's a time in which God is stepping in to a point where they're slaves, where they are facing the most difficulty that they had faced to date. It, it's a time in which uh, they were abused, mistreated, a time where they really didn't see any hope in the future and yet God comes and says this is my son this is my daughter this is mine Israel part of my family that I claim let them go free that they may serve me and that's really powerful it's God when we call God father we're talking about one who can deliver us one who can make us from slaves 
to the children of God. Someone who is strong and mightier than anything that we face in this world. Any of those things we face in ourselves. He's our deliverer. The other thing that we see when it talks about our father in the Old Testament is when God is talking with David and says, I am going to bring a son from you. Matter of fact, it goes all the way back to Abraham. I am going to give you a child, and through that child, all nations on earth are going to be blessed. And he says that to David. David, uh, king of Israel, you are going to have a son, and through that son, the world will be blessed. He will have an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom without end. He will be the Messiah, the new king, the new deliverer, just as it was back in the time of the Israelites in Egypt, so it is with you. I am going to have a new kingdom come through you, a deliverance. And who is that? That's Jesus. Matter of fact, it's those uh, events in the history of Israel that are referred to when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. We will call him Jesus because it's God's salvation which has come, and he will redeem all people. He is the son of the God most high, the one who has the power not only to create, but to recreate us, the one who claims us. So the kingdom is coming. The exodus is at hand. That's what we say when we say our father. It's this looking to God who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Father. Be my father, claim to me, bring me out of this type of destruction. Bring me out from this slavery. Set me free so that I can live with you and serve you. Just like back when Moses said, set my children free that they may serve me. That is where the sense of God the Father in the Old Testament begins with deliverance and the promise of a king who will be the Messiah and grant new deliverance. And then we see Jesus is completely laying hold of this. He's saying, I am the one who is uh, going to deliver you. I am the one who is at work um, to bring about the new kingdom. And he says, Father. He calls God his own Father. And that he is now the the son of David, the king that's coming, who is going to bring that redemption to us. It's an incredible thing when we think about that, that, that we are part of something larger, that, the, that God's supremacy over all the earth comes to a corporate people that he's making his own, and that we are his and God is doing something bigger, that we're signing on to this whole kingdom uh, enterprise that God is about. Do we say, our Father, we say, you've laid hold of me and you've set me as part of your kingdom to do what your kingdom does, and that is to bring freedom and salvation. It is part of being the corporate body. I like what it says in Romans uh, chapter 8. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make us slaves to live in fear. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. You see that? It is our very claim when we say, Father, that we are saying, you are my deliverer. We see that on a very intimate and personal way, too. Think of the prodigal son. It really is misnamed because the one who has uh, just prodigal uh, love and grace is the father. The one who lavishes, which is what the term means, to be prodigal. But there's a son who, who went off and, and took his inheritance and just squandered his life in so many different ways. It's not just about the money. It's the squandering of his own life and who he was. The, the desolation of his own soul. And he finds himself at the very end of his rope. And he says, I have got to get back to the Father. Even if, if I'm only a servant, I'll be better off. And so 
He goes back to the Father all along the way. He is practicing what he's going to say. I am no longer worthy to be your son. I am no longer worthy of it. Take me as your slave, because I know I will be better off as a slave in your house than as one in a faraway land, lost and alone. The Father, when he sees the Son, he opens his arms, he runs, he embraces him, and he calls him his Son. He doesn't even let his son go into this whole speech that he began with. He cuts him off. He says, you're my son. And he says, bring out the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. Have this great banquet. Call everybody to come in because my son who was lost is now found. It's the great love of God that makes us the children. And it's not only the corporate body, but it is ourselves who are embraced by the Father as he calls us his children. So God has come to us saying, I am going to be your father who delivers. I am going to be your father who is king and Messiah. I'm going to be the one who reaches out and takes hold of the people to restore them to be a blessing to the whole world. It's this grand God who is at work who then is very intimately involved in our own restoration. You know, God is the God supreme over all things great and small. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, you know, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Nothing was made that wasn't made through Him. Of course, he's talking about Jesus, who is the Messiah, who made and is making. God's the the God of all the cosmos. There's a wonderful uh, sculpture of a, a child. It's of Jesus, and he has in his hand the globe, so effortlessly lifting and smiling and playing with the world. That's something. God is so much bigger. But he created, he delights, he loves, he is fully engaged in the entire cosmos, but he is engaged in our own small worlds. You know, some of those great things that God has done for all of Israel, for all of humanity, we still say, but what about me? What about me? I need that. Not just someone else. I need that. In Psalm 103, uh, the psalmist says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows that they are formed, how they are formed. He remembers that they are dust. Those who fear him. It's not just everybody, that's the individual. The individual who, who enters into the Holy Presence, the mystery of God through prayer. The mystery of God that says, I am going to boldly come before you. I am risking my life to know you and to hear you and to have you be at work in my life. That's the personal, intimate side. Those small things that are everything and huge in our own lives. The parable that Jesus uh, tells, which I love so much, is the parable of the uh, father in which he says, if, if a son comes to a father and says, could I have a, a loaf of bread? The father's not going to give him a stone. Or, or, or what if your son comes up to you and says, I need a fish to eat. Uh, the a father would give a serpent instead. He says, look, the fathers that you know on earth, they are f uh, frail, they're broken in so many ways. Uh, they give their best that they can out of their limited resources and abilities. And yet the Father in heaven, though is very good, has all the resources at hand, and it is your Father who's going to give you what you need, and he says he will give you the Holy Spirit, who's going to give himself into your life, so that when we pray, it is not like we're praying to some distant God, but we are praying to a God who's involved in our lives, intimately connected, the gift of God, very self, to us. In the... Uh, stories of, of Jesus. We, we remember the miracle, the miracle of the one, the paralytic, who comes and is brought to Jesus. And he says, Jesus says to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. He's a paralytic, and yet Jesus knows as the wise, 
father that he is to this man. It's your sins that you really need to deal with. These are the big things, and I forgive you. I forgive you. I embrace you. And in that time, the man was healed. Sometimes we don't even know what we need, don't we? Sometimes we go for one thing and God does something else. We think we need something in, in, in our, our own aspirations, and God says, no, let me give you the really good thing. Let me give you what's going to be good for you, not just something that you want and you think will make you happy. Let me guide you in, in this way that, that really brings a deep and abundant life, not the flashy surface things. It's amazing how God works in our lives in exactly the way we need him. In the miracles, we see everything from uh, someone who is, uh, has a withered hand and it's restored, someone who is blind and, and their eyes are open, uh, someone who has a demon and, and those demons are cast out. We see those with leprosy that are healed. And we think, wow, these are great miracles. These are great miracles. But you know what? The greatest miracle of all, the absolute greatest, is not the one that we see on the outside. It's the one that happens inside. It's the miracle God who says, come, I make you my child. I will be your father. The greatest miracle of all is that, that we are restored to the one who created us, who loves us enough to call us his children and encourages us to know him truly as our father, our father who loves us more than anything and wants to give us those good gifts. It's that restoration of a relationship. And I tell you, the biggest things, the biggest miracles that I've ever had in my life are when I am restored in relationship with my wife, when we've had difficulties and gone through problems. And I often say, you know, I've been married 30 years, best 28 years of my life. <laughs> because we all have those times which are so difficult, where we're just at odds, where it's hard to get past. And the greatest miracle in my life is in my relationship with my wife. Same thing for my children. Same thing as we are told for our neighbors, that transformation so that we can love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, or even, as Jesus says, that relationship with our enemies so that we are no longer their enemy and that we treat them with love and care and respect. You know, it's those relationships which are the most profound miracles. You know, miracles is when God, out of his plenty, meets our want, meets our limited nature. How is it that God wants to work in your life? What's your greatest need that God wants to come and to bless? Something We don't know how. We don't know exactly what God's going to do. We come in and we boldly and with great risk say, God, Father, I open my life to you. I don't know where this is going to take me, <laughs> but I trust you. I don't know if it's going to hurt or until it brings joy, I don't know. But Father, I trust you. What's your point of greatest need? As you go in the, the next couple days, I encourage you to, to pray this in, in this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That he would give you this day everything you need, your daily bread. That he'll forgive you of your sins. It's an amazing thing how God wants to be your father. He calls you his son. He calls you his daughter. And it's for us to live into that. All that it means that God says, you are my child. I have come to you. I've delivered you. I've given you a Messiah, and I've laid hold of you. You as my people, and you as an individual in great need. Your Father loves you. Your Father wants to give you His Holy Spirit. Ask, as Jesus says, ask the Father, and He will pour Himself into your life. Let's pray.
Lord God, thank you so much that you have come to us because we've been in slavery. Your children in Israel were in slave, slavery very literally. And we have been in slavery in our spirits. Lord God, thank you that you are the one who made and can remake. You're the one who brings revolution in our lives, that we don't live under the tyranny of sin and death, but we enter into your kingdom. We sign on with what you are doing in the world when we say, Father. And Lord God, we know that in our own need, we need your miracles in our own lives, right where we are. And so we cry to you, Father. Father, give me your spirit. Create in me a new heart that I might be right with you, that I might be right with those around me. I am your son. I am your daughter. Amen.